Now everybody, let me tell you a story about Hollywood shame Ooh. Where terrible actors and scripts collide Oh, what a mess it is on the other side So the lights, camera, action begin But all I got was a movie that plunged in a spin From the first scene to the credits that roll oh, Taking its toll Silver screen says pull That movies galore Can't help but wonder what the hell Were they making these for Throwing some cliches To shot the predictable plot It's a train wreck I tell you it's all they ever got And now for our feature presentation Welcome to the Silver Screen Cesspool, where we review the poo. And now your host, the surveyor of cinema, the mocker of moronic movies, the terror of Tiny Town, the last known survivor of Battlefield Earth, the one of many, Alan Smith E. The thing about trying to make a movie that's so bad it's good is that you wind up making a movie that's so bad and not good. For every Sharknado, there are 42,376 thanks killings. Seriously, I did the math. Before I even start to regale you with the plot of the movie, let's take a look at some of the fun facts listed on the IMDB page for thanks killings. First, the central tagline, Gobble, gobble, mother was thought of before the movie's plot. I mean, movies have been made for dumber reasons. I, I can't think of any at the moment, but I'm sure... Actually, no, I'm not sure. The second fun fact is that no one wanted to distribute the film at first, so the filmmakers sold the DVD on Amazon themselves. It took a year to sell 1,000 copies. You should be able to sell 1,000 copies of a DVD on Amazon in 2008 by accident. The third fact from IMDb in the turkey rape scene, a puppeteer is clearly visible in one of the shots. Now, you may be wondering if, in the turkey rape scene, if it is a human sexually assaulting poultry, or if it's the other way around, and my answer would have to be, what the actual f***? Is there any good answer to that question? What mental image do you want to be burned into your mind to wake up to in a cold sweat? <sighs> so the movie opens in 1621, the olden days, as the movie calls it, moments after the first Thanksgiving. The opening shot of the movie is that of the bare right breast of Wanda Lust. Because, of course, that's her name, and Jenny Juggs wasn't available as she was off filming Arbor Day Massacre or something. In the credits, Wanda is listed as Naked Pilgrim. That's the kind of thing you put at the top of your resume when you apply to work the books at a discount tire store. <sighs> The camera pulls back, and we see the left breast, which has a mole on it. She might want to get checked out by a doctor. She takes off fleeing, chest hanging out while dressed as a pilgrim. She's not topless, because we couldn't tell she was supposed to be a pilgrim then. As opposed to, like, a nun or something. Her costume also has a lovely string on the back of the neck hole, and was clearly some cheap store-bought costume. Wasn't even tied tight. She trips over a rock, and while she goes down face first, she's unhurt because of the b breaking her hole. Suddenly, our evil turkey hand puppet shows up and says, Nice b 
this bitch and hacks her once with a 21st century made hatchet, which also has on a bad costume to make it look like a tomahawk. Fortunately, this is not the turkey rape scene. Then op opening credits are set to techno, interspersed with turkey gobbles, which isn't very danceable. The words are all bloody looking, just in case we didn't get this was going to be a slasher film of some sort. Also, much to my surprise, the special effects makeup was done by Troy Smith. You may remember him as the Heisman winning quarterback for the 2006 Ohio State Buckeyes. O.H. Or maybe it's another guy with the same name. It's actually a quite common name now that I think about it. In the present day, we're introduced to our lovable cast, our likable cast, our generic cast of characters. The jock backup quarterback of the sports team. The redneck. The nerd. The hoe. Their words, not mine. And the final girl. They all have names, and I'm sure they had names, but who gives a crap? The redneck is way too excited about Thanksgiving break because he acts like it's spring break. Meanwhile, the airhead, oh, again, their words, not mine, actually does think it's spring break. And in spite of the nerd just meeting three of, out of the four of them, the others decide to road trip back to their hometown in an open air Jeep in November in New England while wearing short sleeves. The redneck acts rednecky. The nerd acts nerdy. The jock acts jockey. And the hoe acts like my college girlfriend. The nerds decide that they all should go around and say what they're thankful for to pass the time. Because that's torture at Thanksgiving dinner and even more so in a tiny cramped jeep. The redneck is thankful that the nerd's mom has the juiciest p in town. The jock finds this hilarious. No one else in the film or real life does, though. The nerd proclaims his intentions to go skinny dipping without any clothes on, as opposed to skinny dipping with clothes on, again in New England in November. Then he's going to have sex quote, with someone in this car, end quote. He wants to be the one doing the sexin. But the hoe says she's not a hoe and nerd boy is out of luck. The final girl responds to this and says, oh, please, your legs are harder to close than the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case. Just putting that murder of a small child out there for laughs by the character we're all supposed to be rooting for. Meanwhile in the woods, some lonely Ted Nugent wannabe and his border collie, Flashy, not to be confused with Lassie, get attacked by our cursed Native American killer turkey after Flashy tinkles on a miniature totem pole, as all Native American icons are completely interchangeable. Apparently, the Turk was just as upset as I was at seeing a dog relieve himself in extreme close-up. Meanwhile, the final girl's dad, apparently the local sheriff, is at home doing paperwork. His wife serves him a steaming hot cup of... Joe. He spits it out and says it tastes like... The wife reveals she did, in fact... Mickey Dookie in the coffee pot as she swirls around the clear glass coffee and announces she wants a divorce. Yummy. The Jeep breaks down after dark. So they do the only logical thing and don't call anybody and set up camp with all the camping gear they somehow had stashed in this already uncomfortably full with five people Jeep. And a cooler in there somehow, too. I don't know. Whatever. 
Nerd finds a sign there in Crawburg, a town famous for being cursed by a murdering turkey that rises from the grave every 505 years and kills the first person it comes into contact with. And there are tons of books on it. And the redneck just happens to have the same name as the pilgrim who caused the turkey to be cursed. The final girl finally has some sense and decides she should probably let her dad know she's not going to be in home in time for dinner and wanders off in the woods where she stumbles upon our killer turkey. Our killer wise cracking turkey looks more like a mummified colon than a turkey, but whatever. I mean, what are we expecting? She flees from danger and heads back to camp, where, believe it or not, they don't believe her that a killer turkey is after her. Then the jock says he believes her story, and that the right proper course of action when being attacked by a murdering holiday dinner is to go to sleep. The final girl, being upset at being patronized by the jock, storms off to the tent, which she zips up and then goes to sleep while everybody else stays awake, so she's following his patronizing advice and nobody else's, which of course makes perfect sense in whatever alternate reality this is supposed to be happening in, and I don't know. The Nuge is out wandering the woods to kill our murdering poultry in revenge for the turkey killing his dog. And he when he discovers the campsite, and at the campsite, he discovers the redneck, who has been sleeping outside in a sleeping bag, is covered with turkey shit. Because this movie is classy, if nothing else. With morning come, the jock can fix his jeep by popping the hood and wiggling a wire a little bit, because we're not even going to, you know, attempt for any technical-sounding realism here. The redneck now believes in the murdering turkey because the turkey shit over him. I don't know. I don't know how you tell what kind of shit turkey shit is, let alone why you would think that it came from a turkey that is going to murder you just because he left a Cleveland steamer on your sleeping bag. <sighs> they drive back home to New England in their Jeep with Ohio plates in fact, all the cars have Ohio plates, and this is supposed to be, you know, where pilgrims were. And somebody failed history or geography or life in general. Meanwhile, the terrible Tom is now hitchhiking, and some creepo decides to pull over and pick up the turkey and give the turkey a ride for cash, ass, or grass. And the turkey ops for ass. and then pulls a shotgun and kills this character so thankfully this is not the turkey rape scene although we will get there eventually turkey now takes the car and is now in hot pursuit of our collegiate crew who has now arrived at their home in new england with the ohio license plates First, they drop off the hoe at her house, and she flirts with the jock. The nerd and the redneck observe that the hoe is trying to get with the jock, to which the final girl again comments that her legs are harder to close than the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case. Classy stuff happening. The jock heads home where his mother eagerly greets him, but he isn't looking forward to talking to dad because of the giant rift in their relationship that has happened over the last two weeks since he became the second string quarterback for the college basketball team or hockey team or who gives a The next part of this movie is, well, just as boring as the rest of it, but now seems like as good a time as any to throw in some more fun facts about this movie. The only actor to get paid in this movie was the one who showed her dance. Which also means she's the only one who was not overpaid. Another fun fact about this movie is that there was a musical adaptation made in 2013. 
And while I, for one, have not seen Thanks Killing the Musical, or whatever they decided to call it, I can only imagine the musical number for the turkey rape scene. I imagine it's a happy, upbeat number with hand clapping and foot stomping and projectile vomiting. Uh, so yeah, back to the plot. The turkey kills the jocks, mom and dad, and he's all upset about not getting his cranberry sauce and stuffing, and not at all about his parents being deceased and having just witnessed it. The crescent rolls just break your heart. <laughs> so the jock decides to meet up with the gang at the redneck's house, minus the hoe, to commiserate and have a beer, because that makes more sense than calling the police or trying to stop the turkey or quitting acting. The hoe, however, is at her house with a random dude, and I'll spare you the details, but it's the turkey rape scene. A more disturbing moment has never been caught on cinema before or after. Non-consensual ghost puppet poultry bestiality, and this is supposed to be a comedy. Hilarious. Ever want to know what a turkey looks like while having an orgasm? Boy, then you're in luck. The turkey delivers the zinger you've been stuffed before, putting her out of our misery. The gang rushes over to the hoe's house to warn her the killer turkey is real, not realizing they're too late. While the jock goes inside to warn her, the rest of them wait outside. The dork proclaims at least her legs were harder to close than John Bonet Ramsey's legs. So if you thought the low point of the movie was the turkey rape scene, like I thought it was going to be, you were sadly mistaken. The jock finds the hoe dead and a wrapper from a gravy-flavored condom. This upsets the redneck because he just got cock-blocked by a turkey. Not my commentary. That's actually a line, he says. The nerd doesn't know how to kill the turkey because nothing they've tried so far has worked, to which the jock points out they haven't actually tried anything. Which is like the only thing in the movie that makes any sense. The turkey in a human costume has coffee with the sheriff who is in a turkey costume. Then he kills him. The gang decides to research how to kill the turkey by reading all the books written on the turkey. Even the prop book is terrible. It's quarter-inch corrugated cardboard with printouts terribly glued to it crookedly. They couldn't even just put a fake dust jacket on a real book. The redneck gets upset for some reason and wanders off, so of course he's the next to die, which is so predictable even the jock calls it out as he leaves. The nerd dies next, and let's face it, no one really cares how or why or misses him. This leaves the jock and the final girl to make kissy face before he also gets killed by foul play. No one cares how these two got killed. We just want it to be over. <sighs> they had more trouble wrapping up the end of this movie than they did with the jock. No, 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 no. <laughs> they almost had me there. Uh, not doing that. <laughs> uh this does leave the final girl to be the final one alive. See how that works? She finally defeats the turkey with the help of that Ted Nugent wannabe who has just been wandering around the woods the entire movie. We're teased with a sequel that takes place in space, which unbelievably somehow did get made. And as one final kick in the pants, they manage to misspell our jock's name in one of the three places it appears in the credits. Johnny, Johnny's dad. Johnny's mom. Double H there, not double N. Filmmakers wish to thank the entire cast and crew for their dedication and support. Without them, this film would not have been possible. So we can blame each and every one of them for this turkey of a movie. On this list includes the city of Columbus, which explains the Ohio license plates and how Troy Smith got involved. So if you feel like giving your family the bird this Thanksgiving, make them watch Thanksgiving. Thanks Killing is available streaming on Pluto and Prime and Tubi, of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Silver Screen Cesspool is written, directed, and starring Alan Smithy. 
Assistant Director, Producer, and Stunt Coordinator, Alan Smithy. Boom Mic Operator, Sound Editing and Music by Alan Smithy. Construction Coordinator, The Amazing Rando. Makeup by Crayola. Catering was provided by the Soylent Corporation. Alan Smithy will be back in Return of the Curse of the Planet of the Prehistoric Bikini Ninjas versus Kingdom of the Bride of the Killer, Shark Cheerleaders 2, Electric Boogaloo.